What's up, everyone? It's Caddy with Money Vesting. Welcome on board for another Market Open live stream here. If you guys can see me, hear me, just give me a thumbs up. Just want to make sure the audio and the video is working well. Pre market, we are lower, but not by a whole lot. We've got the QQQs down a little bit over 33 basis points. We've got the SPY down about half a percent, and the Dow Jones is selling off a little bit over 61 basis points at the moment. There's a lot of fear around Deutsche Bank at the moment. It is down a little bit over 8%. In fact, it was down over 12% at one point, if I'm not mistaken, trading as low as $8.51. It has rallied a little bit from those lows, uh, pushing up over 4.75%. So it was at one point down over 13, 14%. So all eyes are going to be on how the bank is performing. And of course, on the broader markets as well. And then not to mention that the yields are also on the move. We did see the 10-year yield kind of break down below 3.3% today. They're down over 3.6% on the day today right now. Uh, but they did trade down as low as 3.287% at the moment. And another big mover on the day is going to be crude oil um, down over 1.76%. In fact, it has pushed back up a little bit. So it has rallied about almost 2% uh, in just a few hours, but it was trading as low as 66 dollars per barrel, getting a bit of a rejection at 70, 71 dollars per barrel. Uh, but again, welcome on board. If you guys can see me, hear me, just give me a thumbs up. Just want to make sure that everything is working well and the audio and the video is uh, is perfect. So uh, make sure that you do vote if you haven't already. We have the poll going on at the moment and we'll go over some of the upgrades and downgrades here in just a minute. And volatility is slightly higher, up almost 6%, trading as much as 24 Ethereum consolidating sideways at just over 1700 and Bitcoin also just shy of 28,000, kind of in line with that resistance at the moment for BTC. So yields across the board are coming down. This is the most interesting chart because we do have the spread between the 10 and the two year now down to only negative 30 basis points. So we have seen this inversion improve by 73% over the last 15 days alone. That means that the two-year treasury yield has been dropping much faster than the 10-year yield. So both of them are dropping, both of them are going down, but the gap is narrowing, right? Right now, of course, there's an inversion and that inversion gap is narrowing and eventually it will flip once again back over where the 10-year yield will be yielding more than the two-year and this number will turn positive, which is going to suggest that there's not going to be any recession. But in the past, we have seen this indicator turn negative and then go back to positive territory and then recessions have followed up later. But uh, again, lots of lots of momentum here. It's up another 28% today alone and it's up 73% in the last 15 days. So lots of momentum for the yields. They're all selling off, but the two years dropping pretty heavily, much faster than the 10 year. So um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, right now, 75% red, not a surprise. And uh, talking a little bit about some of the upgrades and downgrades. So UBS reiterates Tesla as a buy. Wells Fargo reiterates Microsoft as a top pick, top AI pick. Jeffries downgrades UBS to hold from a buy. <laughs> you know what it is? It, it's kind of like um, what we're really going through. It's kind of like a funny meme where all the banks are going down and they're just like raiding each other. UBS, uh, you know, downgrades maybe Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse downgrades maybe Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank uh, downgrades maybe UBS. It's like everyone's everyone's going down as they're downgrading each other. They're like <laughs> they're failing as they're getting downgraded. It's like crazy. Uh, with the acquisition of Credit Suisse, UBS equity story takes a U-turn. Deal math are compelling on a three-year view, but risk and uncertainty are high in the next 12 months. I do still think that UBS got a steal uh, from this deal here, but Atlantic Equities downgrades block to neutral, and this said, and I quote, the Hindenburg Research Report allegations focus on the cash apps, predatory fees, fake user accounts, and links to criminal activity. We are less concerned about the high fees and user metrics, but a significant proportion of profits could be impacted longer term by improving risk controls to reduce illegal activity. So again, Hindenburg Research definitely hurting block. Yesterday it was down 15, 16%. I think pre-market today, I think it's down another 4 or 5%. I think last time I checked, it was selling off down about 1% now. So it has recovered a little bit back from $59. Um, City adds a positive catalyst. Watch on Lululemon. Bank America re-rates Netflix as a buy. 
Uh, TD Cowan downgrades Coinbase to market perform. And then we got Barclays reiterating Meta as overweight. Uh, TD Cowan also naming McDonald's as a top pick in Europe. City reiterates NVIDIA as a top pick and a buy, top beneficiary of AI. Uh, Loop reiterates Wendy as a buy. And of course, Deutsche Bank shares a slide 14% after sudden spike in the cost of insuring against its default. Talked about it in my yesterday's video, covered it um, in more detail. So go back and check that video out if you haven't already. But it's down about 7.7% at the moment. And uh, the credit default swaps on these, Deutsche Bank, have spiked uh, quite substantially. So again, the uh, credit default swaps leapt to 173 basis points Thursday night from 142 basis points the previous day. Um, and they have been going higher and higher in March. I think they've kind of got up to the same level from back in 2020. So, um, yeah, Ballard is speaking today. Uh, so we do have James Ballard talking. Let me see when. I think he might be talking already, but let's see. So, yeah, I think it's, he's talking at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. So that's, uh, that's going to be, you know, definitely important to the market. Um, and, and what he says, you know, depending on the tone and depending on what he has to say with respect to interest rates and inflation expectations. But, you know, for the most part, we already know, um, you know, what, what Jerome Powell has told us, you know, just a few days ago. The market continues to misprice, uh, not really misprice, but not really agree with what the Federal Reserve has to say um, or, or do. Um, there is a 91% probability that the Fed is going to pause uh, in this upcoming meeting, which is going to be on May 3rd. Well, not really upcoming meeting in the next, uh, what is it, 40 days, 40 days. So in the next uh, 40 days and four hours uh, that they're going to pause. And of course, the probability is expecting for consistent, consistent rate cuts every single meeting um, later this year and next year. So that's what the market's pricing in. That's where the discrepancy is coming from, because, you know, I mentioned in my yesterday's market update video that this is where the market is. And this is what the Fed has told us. They told us another hike and staying here for a little while and then dropping these rates down to 4.3, 4.5% around here in 2024. So this is this is the Fed's expectation, right? Staying here in this area um, at around 5, 5.1% um, for longer. Again, of course, conditions can change and then dropping them down to one, two, three cuts in 2024 to drop them down to 4.25 to 4.5% around those levels. I think it was 4.6%. So, so, so technically it will be over here, but I'm just going off of that range. We can maybe just increase that. So that's going to be the Fed's expectations and what they have laid out in the SCP. And this is what the market's expecting <laughs> all the way over here. Um, that, that, that's what the Federal Reserve is going to do. So eventually again, we'll find out, we'll recalibrate, we'll see, um, what's going to happen. But so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, Russian. Uh, what do you think about FAS and Bank of America? Can we buy now or is it too risky? So FAS is risky uh, to begin with. So definitely, you know, tread carefully. It's down another 4% today. It was down 2% yesterday. So selling right back down because there's, again, some contagion risk. There's more fears coming back into the market with some of the bigger banks. Um, you know, if Deutsche Bank is the next one in the queue, not saying that they are, but if it is the one that is going, going through some problems, then Deutsche Bank being one of the biggest banks in Germany is absolutely going to have some effect on JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, some of the bigger banks over in the US. So there is going to be some counterparty risk um, in that sense. Not that they're going to fail, not that Deutsche Bank is going to fail. It's most likely German government is going to step in, do very some, do something very similar to what you know Credit Suisse, uh, Swiss government did to Credit Suisse with UBS. Um, but there's definitely going to be some risk involved. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why the banks are selling off once again, specifically uh, regional banks and, of course, larger banks as well. So, you know, this is a developing situation. I mean, this has been going on for weeks now, and I think we need to be very careful. And uh, if you are not comfortable with that risk, just kind of see, you know, if you want to be trading banks. If not, there's plenty of other stocks to trade and, and look at. But um, again, XLF watching 2950, and I'm already in FAS. We'll be looking to add a little bit more if it continues to sell off uh, further. So that's going to be my game plan there. Um, can you check out Schwab after yesterday's drop? Yes, so Charles Schwab, I think they released a statement uh, saying that they have plenty of capital to to make sure that their deposits are safe. I'm pretty sure reading a statement uh, here. There we go. So even if depositors flee, Charles Schwab is prepared. That's what they said. I remember reading it yesterday. 
So um, in, in, the, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal, their CEO, Walt Bettinger, told everyone, and I quote, there would be sufficient amount of liquidity right there to cover if 100% of our bank's deposits ran off. That's a pretty bold statement, 100%. And that's kind of restoring confidence, um, just making sure that nothing really happens. And, you know, Charles Schwab hasn't been immune to the chaos strike in the banking sector, tumbling with the bank shares. It's fallen over 34% of the past month. Of course, yesterday it was down even further. But, you know, one thing that you learn over time is what? What is the one thing that you learn over time after the great financial crisis? Can anybody guess what that thing is? And it's specifically to this statement right here. What is it? Let me see. It's like a, it's like a thing that you that you learn over time, specifically after the great financial crisis. Something to do with this statement right here. <laughs> History repeats. No, I was gonna say uh, never never trust a banker. I mean, they all come on they they all come on you know media and news and everywhere. They tell you know liquidity is good, we're safe, we're fine. And next thing you know, they're looking for a bailout. So never trust a banker. Lesson number one. So you know despite despite what they say. It's always the actions are going to speak louder than what they're actually saying, than words. So, um, but no, it's good. I mean, what he's trying to do is restore confidence. And uh, Charles Schwab, unfortunately, is not an SIB. So, you know, as big as it is, it's not a systemically important bank. So, and, and Janet Yellen has been going back and forth in the last couple of days. She just cannot make up her mind what needs to be said um, in order to calm the markets with the banking sector specifically, because... Uh, you know, once she said, you know, all uninsured deposits will be protected. Then she said that that was not a, even a consideration. And then she's backpedaling, you know, to saying that, oh, we're going to protect them. We're going to use our tools. It's like been all over the place. Um, so banks will always get bailed out. Yep. So it really depends on what type of banks, right? So it depends, you know, what type of systemic risk we have. Um, yeah, Toronto's Dave, Dave said anything can go to zero and nothing is safe. Nothing really is safe. That's the that's the thing, right? Nothing is safe in this market. There's there's safety nowhere. I know that right now big tech is kind of considered safe. So you know you've seen Apple outperform. Uh, if you do a simple chart, Apple t divided by let's just do JPM. Apple has seen such a massive outperformance against JP Morgan at 38, 39 percent since the beginning of this year, and more specifically since the beginning of this month. It's, it's seen a 26% outperformance. So um, yes, kind of investors flocking a little bit away from banking over to big tech. And that's simply a liquidity shift. And even today, as you can see, the 10-year yields are down. They're down under 3.3%. So once again, you're seeing this risk-off environment where there is flight to safety away from equities and more specifically away from banks over to, to bonds, government bonds and U.S. treasuries. And that's why yields are rolling over, specifically the two-year. If you come over to 2002Y, zero, zero two you'll notice that it's down almost 6%. It's actually hitting a new low from back in September of 22. So we haven't really seen these levels for the two-year yield um, since September of last year. So it's been a while and we're getting down to 3.6%. It's come off from 5%. It's a pretty substantial drop. It's a 30% drop in the two-year yield. Um, and, you know, we started talking about it like literally a few weeks ago. I was talking about how bonds are really appealing because if you could lock in, think about it, if you could lock in, the two-year bond and get a two, and get a five percent rate of return amid all this uncertainty, that's a win. That's literally a big dub because you're getting paid five percent, and you're locking in for two years. Of course, that's the you know you have to keep that money in till maturity. But considering all the volatility, you know if you've got some cash to park, that's a pretty good yield. I think that's what a lot of people saw, investors saw, and kind of taking advantage of it. And as prices push. Uh, you know, as, as demand comes in, prices get pushed higher, yields once again drop. And that's why the 30% drop in the two-year yield. Um, yeah, if it has that support of 49, risky business, definitely. Yeah, it is It is risky. So um, be careful with that. Uh, PayPal has chance to drop to $70. Okay to buy. So yeah, PayPal, I do have a fair value at around $70. Um, that is going to be that level to watch. It does have a descending triangle forming right now. So just be careful with that. I'm going to go over here in just a minute, but um, yeah, so PayPal does have a little bit of a descending triangle right now. So if you continue to trade in that range, uh, I'll be watching $67 more closely than $70. Bucks. $70 fundamentally is a fair value, but uh, support level is going to stay put at $67. And of course, we got Square, which is still struggling at the moment, you know, after that report. 
um, it definitely does put PayPal in a much better light because, you know, Venmo, very strong growth. It's got great reputation, of course, strong growth, profitable, good cash flows, good growth. Um, so it's, it's a lot more stable compared to uh, compared to Square. Um, so GLD, gold. Uh, yes, I do like gold in general. I mean, I am planning to buy more uh, physical gold, uh, but obviously it's been pushing higher pretty well. It is, again, an ETF, right, I think. Um yeah, Spider Gold Trust. Uh, no dividend though, but uh, it is performing well. It's outperforming the S and P 500, and it, it is obviously doing much better than a lot of other asset classes. Um, she's that triangle is scary. What triangle are we talking about here? The Bermuda Triangle? No, I'm just kidding. What triangle are you talking about? So what will happen to Charles Schwab ETF SCHD? I mean, Schwab US dividend ETF. I mean, they, this is just, think of it as an asset sold, right? I mean, a lot of the ETF issuers um, will have to write these down if they were to go bankrupt as well. But again, you know, if there's any risk of contagion, if there's any risk of a much bigger problem, I mean, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve will step in. Um, and it was, you know, the meeting from Jerome Powell was kind of vague in, in a few places. I don't know if you noticed, but there was a lot of uh, lack of, you know, specificity. I don't know if that's a word, but there was a, very much a lack of detail um, in what Jerome Powell was talking about. There was one question specifically where the interviewer asked that the Fed knew about what, what was going on, right? There was literally, they talked about it in the previous FOMC meeting minutes, and, 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 and the question was, can you confirm that the Federal Reserve knew about some of the systemic risks that were, that were happening with all these institutions? And he pretty much just said, I'll have to come back to you on this. I, I, I don't know. So there was not a lot of uh, detail in some of the answers from Jerome Powell. So it's, uh, they've been going back and forth. They're still going to be using their tools. I did a video earlier. Uh, oh, Descending triangle on PayPal. Okay, got it. Yeah, it is a, it is a pretty significant downtrend for, for PayPal. By the way, I did a video earlier going over the Fed's balance sheet. There was a very uh, mysterious borrower of $60 billion. Definitely go watch that video. Should spark some curiosity there. And, um, you know, how much we've increased in the last two weeks, how much of the QT has been undone. Everything's covered in that video. And, of course, a little bit of detail analysis on Deutsche Bank as well. Um. So fair value in Bank of America, I have not really done a fair value analysis on B of A, but I can definitely do that in the future. The problem with a lot of these U.S. banks, and it's the reason why it's so hard to evaluate, is because uh, they're uh, because of their assets, right? They can they can report their book values uh, because that's the hold to maturity or you know their their securities in terms of mortgage backed securities and U.S. Treasuries that are on the books. But that's the book value, right? It's hard to determine what their actual asset market value is. And as long as you don't know that, you know, we we can't really look at it in a very appropriate manner, right? In terms of how the balance sheet stacks up, right? With respect to assets and liabilities. So it is a little bit more of a challenge just analyzing banks from a balance sheet perspective. Sure, I mean, you can take a look at their growth and the net income margin. You can forecast that out and, and look at their fair value. And the dividend, but from a balance sheet perspective, it becomes a bit of a challenge because we don't have the market values. Um, so what's a good buying price for Tesla? Frankie's asking. So for me personally, I'm waiting for about 120s, 120s to 130s around those levels is what I'm really excited for, for Tesla. Um, and I also do have covered calls all the way up to 250 for the stock. If I get called away at those prices, I am fine. Uh, I don't mind. I'm just going to be getting rid of some of the shares and trimming a little bit. Uh, yes, BSC video, please. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Uh, should look into Canadian banks as well. Yep, so I think Royal Bank of Canada is an SIB, systemically important bank, so that was part of the list. Um, it is large enough to not be allowed to fail, pretty much. So if it, if that were to happen, you know, the Canadian government, along with the US government, I think will step in to protect that bank. So RY is the ticker symbol on the Toronto Stock Exchange and RY also on the New York Stock Exchange. It's been selling off. 
from $104, so it is still down to 91, 12%. Um, but it's been one of the best performing stocks, one of the best performing banks, I should say, with a very good dividend yield. Yeah, so we can we can take a look at the, look at this as well. Um, all right, so let's just uh, go into the indexes here. QQQ is still down 36 basis points. I think yesterday's price action was quite interesting, and and this is exactly why you know I mentioned my other video because there were some comments about it. Um, you know, saying that you know futures have rallied. You know, they've gone up one two percent. The video is irrelevant. What what really is irrelevant is the gap ups and the gap downs, right? Futures. I mean doesn't matter what happens overnight. What really matters is what happens intraday, right? I've, I've kind of mentioned that multiple times, but you can see days like these, right? You can have the markets rally, uh, you know, 2.2%. Like at one point, the Nasdaq was up 2.5%. Very strong green day. What happened after? Well, we gave up from 11 a.m. all the way till 3 p.m. We gave up all those gains and the Nasdaq dropped 2.3%. So, you know, it is very possible for the markets to gap up 3% or, or really very high and then sell right back down and give up all the gains. And it's very much a possibility the markets gap down pretty heavily and then rally intraday to uh, to finish green. So what happens overnight, I think take it with a grain of salt, doesn't really matter because the volume is also a lot lower, but intraday I think is where the real price action is. Lots of liquidity, lots of volume, lots of volatility. So that's what needs to be understood um, I think in a much better way. So uh, right now we are pulling back. Yesterday we filled that entire gap and then we started to see some buyers to step in. So that is going to be that intraday uh, support that we're going to be paying attention to see if the Nasdaq actually breaks below 11,684. The implied open is going to be around uh, around here, 11,750 levels. So that's what we're going to be watching and see if um, the Nasdaq breaks below that level today. Same thing with the S&P 500. So again, we broke down. Um, we, In fact, at one point we were red. The S&P at one point was down over 46.50 basis points, right? So we were down at one point. And that's all from, you know, being up almost 2%. That was the intraday sell-off. Um, so this is going to be that support here. Intraday at just a little bit over 3,900. That's where we bounced off of yesterday. So we're going to end the poll. Um, 61% expecting the markets uh, to be gr red and 32% green. So, Caddy, I'm not disappointed. You're not covering Man United stock at the moment. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll cover it eventually, though. All right. So, 10 year yields is a little bit over 3.3%. Volatility is back over 24 and crude oil prices also down on the day, trading a little bit under $69. And of course, we got Tesla slightly lower, Google slightly lower, Microsoft slightly down, Apple flat. And of course, banks are hurting right now, still selling off. All right, let's do this. Let's see what the market has in store for us. How are we going to close out the week? So S&P opening in down 38 basis points, 39.33 is that open. We've got the Dow opening in down 157 points or about half a percent. And the NASDAQ close opening in just at 11,750. The implied open was right at that price. So support level is going to stay put. So I've got the green lines as the support. If you break down below those levels, then we are starting to break down from not only yesterday's low, but the day before uh, as well. Uh, better risk reward at 39 bucks. Are you in? So, well, I'm already in in FAS, uh, but I'm actually watching XLF. That's a much better indicator. Like I said, if you're trading leverage ETFs, looking at leverage ETFs is not really um, worth the time because, you know, they're levered and they are rebalanced every day. Um, and there is no demand supply mechanics or they're not really holding on to any stocks. It's the actual underlying ETF that it's tracking that's actually worth looking at. So for me... If I'm trading FAS, I'm still going to be looking at XLF to look at where the next next support is. So 2950 is that next support, technically speaking, for XLF. So that's what I will be paying attention to. Um, if XLF gets down to that level, then I will be adding a little bit more on FAS. And that's, uh, again, TMF and FAS are two positions that I'm still building onto right now. Um... Is there any difference in choosing S&P 500 ETFs if you are non-U.S. citizen for tax? Huh. 
I mean, just a regular Vanguard index fund or an ETF would be just fine, but definitely do consult with your own tax advisor from your jurisdiction. So my thoughts on travel stocks, uh, again, Matthew, they're actually, you know, with a lot of debt. Unfortunately, their cost of debt's going up, right? So as interest rates keep going up, I mean, you take a look at, you know, most airlines with the exception of Southwest, most cruise lines are heavily indebted, right? A lot of these companies have billions of dollars of debt. Um, and, and as cost of debt goes up, their interest payment goes up. So I'm not particularly a huge fan of travel stocks. Um, I know they can be very volatile. They can be rewarding in, in their own way, but I'm just not for it because a balance sheet just doesn't align with what I look for. John saying everything please bottom right now. Um, yeah, so NASDAQ here down about half a percent. Again, remember, this is going to be that support intraday. We'll see if you actually do get a validation. Both the S&P is kind of approaching that support from yesterday at 39.21. And we got the NASDAQ also approaching down at 11,680. That's going to be the level from yesterday's low. And both of them are down about half a percent right now. So we'll see if we actually do see some buyers stepping in or if we continue to see the market sell off. So talking about Apple here, down 36 basis points. So taking a bit of a breather. Google is down about 81 basis points. Amazon's the one that's selling off the most. And AMD finally back under $99. Uh, Tesla's down. Uh, Netflix still charging. Meta with an upgrade up a little bit over 87 basis points, back over 206. Uh, then among the biggest winners, we do have UVXY, which is a volatility short-term. Futures ETF up over 7.8, almost 8%. We do have Activision Blizzard pushing up. And that's going to be it. Like, you got Tatum Interactive, you got Intuitive Surgical, Baidu, Roblox, Fubo. And then the ones that are down, of course, uh, Marathon's down, TTCF, and then Banks. Let's check them out. So, among Banks, let's see the change. So, uh, Deutsche Bank down 6.8, a little bit under 9 bucks. BNB Paribas down 6%. Credit Suisse also down 55 then we got um, FAS down 4%, a little bit under 50 bucks. Barclays is down. Almost all banks are down anywhere between 1% to as much as 5 6%. And some of the big U.S. banks, so JP Morgan down 1.2%, Bank of America down 1%. And we've got uh, PayPal down about 80 basis points. Once again, it's Burbank that's actually doing much better. All right, so S&P is perfectly coming down to its yesterday's low. Uh, we'll see if any buyers bite here, like, just like they did yesterday. So it's not unlikely to see some buyers stepping in at these prices. So I've got the VVOPs on as well. We've got the middle VVOP sitting at 39.30. We'll see if you actually do get... So we got a bullish engulfing candle already. And we'll see if any buyers step in to break us back above that middle VVOP. And we're oversold on both on the R side and the Magdalene one minute chart. All right. Um, Larry, yes, uh, I'm still holding uh, WBA. Uh, VIX broken. So VIX really not moving much. Um, still up 5.7% though because the markets are selling off. So there is volatility but we are seeing the S&P climb back up. 39.30 is going to be that threshold for NASDAQ. Still posting some red candles, mostly because of Apple here. Apple's not doing too well. Uh, time to buy VFH. So again, if you are for some of the larger banks, because if you think about VFH, XLF, like these are all big banks. If a lot of this news keeps on coming on, right? So, I mean, there was a time when we were stabilizing a little bit and then you have Deutsche Bank uh, on the news today, kind of, you know, selling off credit default swaps, kind of spiking a little bit down 5.3%. 
So if you kind of see this, you know, resurface every so often because of the higher cost of borrowing rates are higher. And, and remember, this problem is far from over because the Federal Reserve is um, they're providing the liquidity, but they're not reducing the cost of borrowing. Right. And uh, and that's the big problem for a lot of these banks is if yields stay higher. So they're going to get some relief here. If yields keep pulling back, so as you can see, this is the entire yield um, chart that I have. And this is, by the way, available to all the members. You can simply go to TradingView and, and, and see that for yourself. But if you pretty much go over to how the yields have gone up, these are all the yields, right? Including the UK gilts and the US yields. All of them have converged and pushed up, you know, from, from their respective levels. And they were, you know, just a few years ago, 2021, uh, the purple line is the three-month treasury, um, and the and the blue one is a six-month. That is the most important one because it is short duration, right? I mean, ideally, banks would want to invest in short duration uh, treasuries. Why? Because their 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 deposits are demand deposits, right? They're on demand, um, so so of course their depositors can come asking for their money anytime, right? So they they can't lock their deposits in for a long duration. That was a mishap. That was a big problem there. They borrowed short and lent or invested super long uh, until maturity. So because they couldn't find yields, they couldn't find, you know, where they could make money at that time because yields were so lower. So it, there, there might be some relief in the market value of these assets as yields are coming down. Once again, you're seeing prices go back up. So TLT, for example, I mean, this month, it is up over 5.7%. So TLT is pushed up this month. That's going to be a bit of relief, but look at what's happened since 2020, right? It's dropped 45%, right? It's a bond price ETFs. I don't know if there's going to be a mortgage-backed security ETF that I feel like there was. Uh, let's see. Yep, so Vanguard uh, mortgage-backed security ETF. This is a good one to track if you are looking at uh, you know, mortgage rates and with respect to how the ETF itself is doing. And since 2021, look at how stable it was. It was. And if you kind of compare it to how it's done, um, take a look at this, right? Significant upside. I mean, it's just been pushing up 40, 40%, which I know it's not a lot, but that's how, you know, banks operate. It's like they, they want to be investing in mortgage-backed securities. They want to be invested in U.S. treasuries. Same thing is with TLT, right? If you take a look at this entire chart, it's just been an uptrend. It's been consistently pushing higher 305%. And the one that we just looked at also in a very similar trajectory. What nobody accounted for was the interest rate risk. The, the sheer momentum and the aggressiveness of the Fed to raise rates has resulted in this significant sell-off, 18%. Um, and again, you can kind of see how it was up, up, and up, and up. And then boom, big, big drop down. Same thing with... Um, Same thing with uh, TLT, right? It was very much on an uptrend, 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 and then big, big move down. So it should be a relief, but again, we've got a long way to go for the bonds to actually do better and to do well. Uh, but no, to to you know answer your question, uh, financials right now just you know trade at your own risk because they are extremely volatile, and they can be they can be quite risky to to begin with because of all the headlines that are coming in. But I do still think that some of the larger banks, so SIBs are still a much um, much better place to be in within banks because they're the ones that are going to be protected. They're the ones that are too big to fail, so to speak. Yeah, Baba Rocketing. <laughs> Alibaba here. So Chinese stocks are uh, doing relatively better. This week, Alibaba is up 7.5%. And it just continues to, to push higher here, which is, which is good to see. I think the markets are going to continue to validate yesterday's low. I think that's... We, we saw some serious buyers stepping in after, you know, hours of selling pressure. We had some buyers stepping in at those levels. So I do think that the NASDAQ can hold up 11,600. On the week, we'd be up 70 basis points. We'd pretty much have like a very flat week. And S&P would close in flat, literally flat. But take a look at this candle. Wow. Sellers are serious. 
Maybe that could be the title for tomorrow's video. Sellers are serious. Uh, but no, this is a pretty significant candle, right? From 4,038, that's a full 100 point move, 125 point move this entire week. So Russian uh, for Baba, yes, I would definitely be paying attention to it as it continues to kind of move back up into that green zone. Um, there is good risk reward setting up with the RSI, with the MACD. So uh, yes, this is an idea that can can be played um, over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, but make sure that you have your proper stop losses. Risk management is key, as I've always mentioned. Um, and target's still going to be up to 121. All right. Oof. S&P really struggling here. Oh, starting to really accelerate here. Maybe I said a little too soon or maybe I jinxed it, but we are starting to accelerate further down on the markets and most of it coming from Tesla, which is now down almost 2%. We've got Microsoft also not finding any support. Man, it feels a lot like a consolidation type market, doesn't it? January was super green. February was red. March is like mostly down, but more or less flat. Um, maybe maybe tech stocks have done well. I mean, Apple for the month of March has done really well, I guess. Up 7.2%. So it's uh, pushing higher, of course. NVIDIA is absolutely crushing it. Up 15%. Tesla in the month of March is down 8%. Uh, Amazon, I think, is also down in the month of March. Or no, it's slightly up 3%. PayPal, slightly down. Square, of course, got crushed yesterday. It was having a good month until yesterday. Um, and then we've got, what, Microsoft up 10% in the month of March and so doing great. And Google is also doing really well. And Meta, yeah, five consecutive months of absolute greenery. For meta so it's been it's been a lot of consolidation um you know for the aggregate markets but i think it's a lot macro driven very much macro driven i think valuations have been put on the side technicals have mattered but not to the extent of inflation and interest rate projections and you know with the banking crisis everything's just been put to side put to the side All right, I mean, S&P did break down a little bit here. So we did see a breakdown below yesterday's low. The NASDAQ is actually perfectly holding up the yesterday's low, 11,682. Yeah, valuations are too high. I do agree. I think they are a little bit on the higher end. So number one, what is the fair value of XBI? I, fair value for XBI is going to be difficult to calculate. I don't have one because it's an ETF comprised of a lot of biotech stocks. So I don't have a fair value for, uh, for XBI per se. Yeah, it's all sentiment driven right now. Kevin says, I agree. So 99.3% probability that the Fed is going to pause and then cut all the way. Nine cuts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cuts. Eight cuts right now. Priced in. Eight cuts is uh, 2%. And one cut is 25 base points, 2%. So we're going to be expected to come down from 4.5, 4.75 down to 2.5, 2.75. All right, so quick poll from everyone. What do you all think? Gap fill to the upside or acceleration to the downside? 
By the way, make sure that you drop a like, everyone. 73 likes only with 380 people watching. Come on. We can easily get up to over 300 likes at least, at least. But uh, but let me know, what do you guys think? Is it going to be a gap fill on the upside or continued momentum to the downside with more acceleration and uh, selling pressure? Deutsche Bank down 7%. For the month, it's down 28 And banks continue to obviously struggle. Um, we got hopefully green and crash and burn. Uh, 375 by next Thursday. Gap up, down, down, down. Gap to the upside, so fill that gap, you mean, Breezy? Uh, down, 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 down. So, Sanjeev, great question. Uh, assuming that the Fed cuts three times, where do you think the S&P Nasdaq will end this year? I mean, three times this year, right? That's what you're asking. Like, if they cut in the next three meetings, like, pause next meeting and then one, two, three, and then don't cut here, just stay at 4%, 4.25%. I think a lot of it is going to depend on inflation. If inflation, I mean, the only reason they're going to be more um, more motivated to cut rates is if inflation starts to roll over, right? If inflation doesn't come down, then they're going to pause. They're going to keep rates higher for longer. I think another thing what I, I, there's a big denial about is that Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve don't necessarily care too much about the economy. I mean, they do, but not more than inflation, right? Inflation is a much bigger problem for them to handle than the economy. So for if, if inflation, for example, accelerates again, starts to go back up, you know, then it's going to start sounding some alarms once again, and, and Federal Reserve will have to come in hot and heavy the next meeting and, and with respect to rate hikes. So it really is, I mean, inflation has all the cards, right now so if it does drop down and interest rates are cut then yeah absolutely i think the market has a lot of potential to recover a lot of those losses and start to push back up and with the lower interest rates i mean you're, you're going to find valuations to kind of recalibrate to the upside uh, it's going to be a much better macro environment for stocks to trade in and we can easily you know get up to higher earnings because of that uh, increase in growth spending so that's going to be a much better environment for stocks. But if inflation stays here or accelerates to the upside again or stays sticky, stubborn, doesn't come down fast enough, and the Fed decides to pause rates, stay at these elevated levels, I think we're going to be looking at a more of a stagnation type environment where stocks generally just trade sideways. They do trade higher and lower depending on the macros, but generally speaking, they just trade sideways and consolidate. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining. Welcome on board. Um, so, uh, Caddy, what is your market forecast for the next two to three years? Hashtag big picture. Uh, great question. So, over the longer term, I do expect inflation to trend lower, whether it's going to be this year. I don't think it's going to be this year, but next year, uh, I do expect inflation to generally just trend lower um, and, and the Federal Reserve to start cutting rates, but not to a point where we drop them down back to zero or one or two percent. I think a more reasonable level would be around closer to 25 to 3% is where I think interest rates should be over the longer term and inflation to stabilize at around those levels. I would necessarily I would I would want to be in an environment where where interest rates do stay higher than inflation, right? So because if you if you consider real interest rates, I mean they're still negative if you consider for inflation, I would want to be longer term in, a, in an environment where interest rates are higher than where inflation is. So, so longer term, I do expect inflation to be back down, um, you know, closer to the Fed's target and the interest rates to be around 3%. And, and, and that, that environment for us to see good uh, potential returns for from equity markets. Um, and, and going back to some reasonable expectations, I think the last few years, markets expectations have completely shifted. Um from like the average seven to eight percent compounded annual return to seven to eight percent per day. I think that's been a big shift because of so much quantitative easing, so much money printing and stimulus pumped into the market and this 
seeing the markets go up as fast and as high as they did, um, I think market expectations have really me been messed up, right? Everybody just thinks that, okay, markets can go up 5 7% or individual stocks can go up 10 15 20% in one day. And that's what we need to be looking at. But I think there needs to be a big recalibration in where expectations are. And, and over, the, over the longer term, we're going to be back to that average. Oleg is saying that they should print a bit more. Are you serious, Oleg? Come on, man. Do you think they should print more money? <laughs> what? Oh, man. So when does Blar talk? He's actually talking right now. He's supposed to start at 9.30. Uh, we're not streaming it right now, but um, NASDAQ here, I mean, came down to that support. Now starting to see some buyers stepping in. S&P still broke down from its yesterday's low, uh, but still down 72%, uh, 72 basis points, not 72%, 0.72%, uh, and the NASDAQ is also down 0.6% right now. Uh, what do you think about selling calls and puts on leverage ETFs, specifically SOXL? Just be careful, Gabe. I mean, this can be really volatile. I, I know what the temptation is to get the premiums out of a leverage ETF. They can be cash cows, but be careful because they are incredibly volatile. So you want to be paying attention to the delta, your strike prices, the volatility, all those things. Pay attention to it. Rate hikes accelerate QE. What is bullish them like more? Um, I don't think I fully understand how rate hikes are going to be QE. But, um, but so we are seeing some stocks recover. I mean, Apple is pretty much flat. Microsoft's also pushing right back up. And we've got Tesla here only down 1% now. And Google also recovering a bit. So we are seeing some buyers stepping in. Specifically on the NASDAQ side, you're seeing a lot of buyers to step back in at that yesterday's low. So this is exactly where we bounced off of yesterday and the buyers stepped in. And right now, that's what we're seeing. So anyway, so everyone, thank you so much for joining in. I really appreciate all of you. Make sure that you drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and the link to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below if you're interested in joining us. Wish you all a fantastic weekend. Enjoy. Take a break. I know I need one because it's been crazy for the past couple weeks. We are through with FOMC. We're through with inflation. We're through with unemployment. We're through with testimonies for both Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell. I think next week we don't have a lot of things coming out. Uh, we may have, yeah, it's the last week of March, so we may have the GDP numbers coming out for the for the fourth quarter, 2022. So this is going to be the third and final revised GDP estimate. We may have some consumer sentiment and consumer expectations coming out and some other data and a few earnings sprinkled in. So it's going to be, I think, a pretty non-eventful week unless a lot of things happen over the weekend in Europe or in the U.S. with respect to the banks. So again, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Hope you all enjoy the weekend. Drop a like, subscribe. Links to our Discord and Patreon down below. Happy investing. I'll see you.